Welcome to the uh, Caddies United Happy Hour. I'm your host, D'Lo. I've got two young guests with me today. I've got Jordan Guilford and um, Dave Pelicadus. Okay, you'll have to help me with the last name, Dave. We'll just call you Big Wave for now. But are you guys there? Are you with me? We're here. We're here. I am here. All right. Great, great. So, so everybody knows um, who you are and who you caddy for. Let's start with you, Jordan, and then uh, just kind of give us a brief history, like um, how long you've been caddying for your player, who your player is, and, and really how, how you guys made the connection to caddying. Sure. Um, so I work for Bo Hostler, and I've been with him for about three years, and I got in touch with Bo through uh, mutual friends and ended up working for him once when he was an amateur. And when he made the decision to turn pro, he asked me if I wanted to caddy for him. So I gladly accepted his offer and have been with him uh, for about three years. So Very cool. Very cool. Um, so it was a scenario where mutual friends got you guys together. Did, did you go to the minor leagues, the Corn Ferry at all? Or were you guys qualified straight up into the PJ Tour? No, he um, he received a few sponsors exemptions when he got out of college, and then wasn't uh, wasn't able to earn status through those, um, and evidently went to a Monday qualifier for a corn fairy event, and got through the qualifier, and then played in that corn fairy event in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, finished solo second and that got him status on the corn fairy tour and then he was able to play the rest of the corn fairy season and get his card uh that way so oh very cool all right so dave i want to say i want to i want to mulligan on your last name i got it now it's it's pelicudas right pelicudas right. there it oh, is D-Lo. all right it's a very intimidating name with all the uh, vowels in there. So uh, that, uh, how about a brief history on, on, you know, how you got started, who you currently caddy for and, and really what got you into the caddy game? Yeah, I, uh, I played college golf at Pepperdine and I had just some good buddies through, you know, college and amateur golf ranks. And one of them that I actually grew up in the same neighborhood with in um, Irvine in Southern California was Brian Campbell. He was a year older than I was, um, and he was coming up. He graduated and finished low-am at Chambers Bay U.S. Open and then um, got Corn Ferry status back then, Webb. And he asked me, I remember during senior year of my uh, college, like winter break, I had a job offer from a senior year internship to, like, start working in L.A., but Brian asked me, he's like, hey, if you're not going to turn pro, why don't you come travel and caddy around and just see if you can help me get to the tour and we'll hang out and have some fun over the summer. So I said, that sounds way better than a desk job. And so I started with him as soon as I graduated. I think I graduated on uh, April 30th. And then I think literally a week later, like May 7th, I was on the bag for him at the BMW in South Carolina web event and finish he finished second place there and then we went on the next three weeks to have another like an eighth a second and a six so four straight top tens um being on the bag for me and i was hooked and i was like well i'm gonna be caddying from now this is a blast in those four events were you able to secure a pj tour status yeah so through those four events um we pretty much especially with the two second places he pretty much locked up top 25 and after the card ceremony in Portland, he goes, well, I mean, I, I assume you're coming with me. So I decided to go up and caddy for him on tour. And that's kind of how I got my start and loved it since. And I'm now caddying for Sam Ryder, um, who I actually met on the web when I was caddying for Brian. And so it's kind of just like, you know, when you're paired with people and traveling, you develop friendships and relationships and it just goes from there. And it's been a blast working for Sam. So how, how many years now has that been that you've been uh, catting like this? I started 2016. So this is my fourth year. Fourth year. And in, since then, 
has there only been the two full-time players, uh, Campbell uh, and now Ryder, or? No, I've, I've, did, I've done a few fill-in weeks here and there for Jonathan Bird. Um, and then I actually last got to – I got to caddy for Blaine Barber for a year after his caddy got hurt in Hawaii. And that was right after Brian had not kept his card his rookie year. And so, I mean, Blaine pretty much was the one who gave me the chance to, I mean, obviously after a tragic event, but it gave me the opportunity to kind of fill in, help out and stay in the, stay in the loop per se and keep caddying. In the game. Jordan. So, so, um, Dave has been caddying for four years now. And when did you say again, you started about that same time four years ago or, or what's the yeah, story? It was, it was kind of weird. Cause, um, Bo got injured in the national championships in 2016. So he was, he was going to turn pro after that, but that was delayed because of this injury. And so he ended up getting surgery and, had to go through the rehab process of having a surgery on a torn labrum. So he went, he ended up getting healthy around, I want to say like October or November, um, just healthy enough to hit balls in the driving range. And then um, played a Adams tour event in, I want to say like the first week of December. And I mean, I, I caddied for him in that, but it, it doesn't even really count because he was, I mean, we were in a golf cart, so I was kind of okay, So the reason I'm asking and getting at this, so a few weeks ago we had a 30-year a veteran, and you guys are three and four years in, and he named off well over 50 players that he caddied for. So at the moment, both of you guys being so green and so young, you pretty much can caddy – you can count on one hand the players you've caddied for, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I think it. I think it's kind of cool that you guys are just now, you know, starting to, you know, you're ankle deep in this thing, this caddying game, this PGA Tour, and you know, you've definitely been around long enough now to know like how to get around these cities and 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 you know what what's what. You're kind of starting to develop your own your own little routines at these tournaments as you're going back the second and third and fourth times. Um, which is which is cool to see, and so that's why I really I wanted to have you guys and and try and pick your brains on on how different it is now. You guys are both in your twenties, I'm assuming, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And so when I started, it was in the late nineties, 1998. So I spent 98, 99, 2000, uh, 01, and 02 uh, on the Corn Ferry Tour in my young twenties. So like you guys were, you know, this was 20 years ago. Um, and so I, the differences now is obviously the purses are bigger. The, the profession itself has kind of grown into something pretty massive, but, um, you know, me not being as in touch with the younger generation, I'll call you guys the next gen for the rest of the show here. So the next gen, you know, my generation, we would go and hang out and tell golf stories and stuff in the evenings at the local pub or, you know, restaurant, bar, and kind of every city we went to, we were, you know, we were known to, you know, kind of cat around. Is is that going on as much anymore with your next gen? Uh, do you, that's kind of the question I'm getting at is your evening time, your off course time, uh, are, you, are you out there kind of hanging out with the locals and, and kind of trying to meet and greet the, uh, you know, the local girls? Or I, I know you guys have a way different opportunity now with, apps and stuff like that i mean you don't really even have to talk to girls much anymore you can click and swipe but what's what's the mo for the next gen guys hanging out after the courses what are you guys getting into dave you take this one you want me to take this okay um, i'd say i mean i guess times have changed a little bit d -Lo, but i'd say it's a, a little bit similar i'd say somewhat more so, like, the guys that – I mean, I know Jordan and I room together a lot, and we have a handful of other guys, too, that, that are around our age that we room together. We like – I mean, we like to go to the gym maybe after we finish, get a workout in, sweat a little bit, and then go, you know, go to Whole Foods, 
um, try some good restaurants. I guess it really depends on the city and what time we tee off the next day. But I mean, I definitely, I definitely love, you know, going out to the bars and restaurants and seeing the different cities, especially over the summer, you know, and it's, it's late till pretty late and you get, especially in the Midwest. I remember, um, that turn the 3M in Minnesota last year was my first time in Minneapolis. And that was an awesome city. Went to a couple of rooftop bars, a minor league baseball game. And I mean, I guess it's still the same, you know, especially with your traveling buddies, it's just kind of, you like to hang out and. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that it, with the exception of maybe the gym. So maybe you're more likely to meet some of the locals at the gyms you go to, uh, as opposed to going straight in and having a couple of brewskis or whatever after the rounds or, yeah, or whatever. Know, uh, we're not, I mean, we're not opposed to going out to the bars and, uh, getting, getting after it. But, uh, I think that all depends on the, the tea time and, uh, is how uh how your pony's doing in the tournament right right. of course of course i get it i get it and like all of us know that you know we're not we're not staying out all night anymore if it's uh early morning tea time or you know and and most of the fun we have is usually pre pre first round you know like the the baseball games and the the rooftop bars and stuff like that it's funny that you were talking about that minnesota event at 3m uh, that was just an awesome event. I see that tournament growing into like, yeah. uh, like a premier event. That area was so much fun. And we stayed downtown and, and just had a big time with the baseball and, and the, and the city itself was really cool. Yeah. And the, uh, that, uh, that one definitely stays on the list for a while. The Val, uh, Valspar was kind enough to throw the caddies a party that week and we, we got to go curling. Oh, that's right. That, uh, yeah, I went curling. And, like, was how often do you get a chance to go curling? I mean, yeah. that was – I heard that was a huge uh, success that – that uh, because I it was closer to the golf course and I was 20 minutes, 30 minutes away. I didn't make that one. But I'm definitely going to put it on the list for sure. Um, um, seeing that, seeing that, you know, now that you say that, and, and like, Valspar – throwing different parties and stuff like that. We're starting to see a lot more of that. There was one in Hawaii where the caddies were invited and players were invited. Um, Do you guys enjoy meeting and, and um, hanging out at those parties with either other caddies that you might not really see at the golf course? Have you guys made any connections like to some of the veterans or, or anything like that? Yeah, I, I definitely enjoy going to those parties and seeing some fellow caddies kind of off, off the golf course and see how they are as a person not attached to caddying. And then, um, yeah, those parties are always fun. Um, Let me jump into this. Let me jump into this because when I first started and, um, you know, you make your way up, you meet, you meet more caddies, your, your group kind of widens, your network widens a little bit. But but the first time I remember being a rookie on tour, uh, I would out I was out walking courses like we have to do, especially when it's your first time around. Um, have you made any connections like uh, you know, let's just say like a big brother type, like one of these these veterans go take you under your wing and be like, hey, you need to know about this little area over here, over this bunker, or this, or or somebody you kind of walk the courses with. Do you guys have any? any connections to a veteran like that that's kind of helped bring you along and, and, and make you better at caddying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mueller, <laughs> you guys went silent on me here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my, my video just kind of cut out for a second. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've definitely had a, a handful of caddies that have helped me along the way because I didn't know what I was going to – I didn't have any experience when I first came out. So Joel Stock was the first one, the first caddy that I got in touch with. And he took me under his wing and showed me kind of how things go out there. And then, I mean, Steve Hale, AKA Pepsi, he helped me out a lot. Uh, Waldo helped me out a lot. Um, Michael Greller and man, the, the list, the list goes on. Dave, what, uh, Dave, what about you? Do you have like a, a veteran connection, somebody that's kind of helped bring you along or, or give you information, you know, that you didn't really know about a place or, or something like that? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, you know, we're going out and walking the course. I think we like Gilf and I like walking together when we can. And it's when you're out there and you see older guys or guys that have been around, it's really easy to ask questions and, you know, get in a few holes here and there with them. And I think that helps specifically going city to city, you know, even if you haven't planned to walk out, but when you see someone you're like, well, you know, I know he's been here many times more than I am. If I have a question or show him something in the book and get his input, but um, yeah, like you'll said, I have a strong, the strong Southern California connection. They're not super veterans, but guys have been out there for even four or five years longer than me are guys like Joe Griner and um, Carl Smith, who was actually my assistant coach at Pepperdine before he left to caddy for Cameron. And then now we're out doing the same thing. Um, like Gil said too, I think my, uh, that first year caddying with Brian, we, we got a couple of cool weekend pairings. And I remember um, playing with James Hahn once when Marker Bannock was caddying for him and he was awesome and said, Hey, if there's anything you ever need. If there's any courses you have questions with their cities or need to know where to stay, feel free to reach out and gave me his number. Um, and so those are, and like, I think Waldo, Waldo's definitely done the same with me too. And I, it's, those are the ki- kinds of things that I, if I'm fortunate enough to be caddying for a longer period of time and can, can give back, I think that's, those are things I really appreciated and, and were helpful. And so um, I like that. And that's kind of gives you like the connection and the camaraderie of, out there. I mean, we're, we're all competing Thursday through Sunday against each other, but really we're, you know, traveling circus and we're all kind of in it together at, to some extent. So right. that's nice right. to well, work that's, together. That's very cool. So that, and that's what I was trying to get out of you just being young. Um, now let me ask you this, Dave, other than the laser, is there any other technology you guys are using this next gen? I mean, are, are you ever, you know, using your computer or Google Earth or anything like, I mean, because when I started, it was the laser was really your only thing. And then they kind of, there was this thing called a clinometer that was starting to give you the, the slope uphill and downhill. And then, uh, you know, percentage was a thing. And then all of a sudden there was a green reading machine and you'd go mark out your own greens. And that was like technology yeah. moving forward. Uh, what is, what does the next gen technology look like? Is there something you guys are using on your phones? What, what, what do you, anything? You know, Gilf knows a lot about mapping greens. And <laughs> I think uh, that goes back to when we were both in our corn fairy days. I think now the, um, on tour, the books are so good. Mark Long does a great job. But I would say when I was using Google Earth, um, that was definitely more for the Corn Ferry Tour. But mapping courses now, I mean, it's always nice to pull up Google Earth too. If you see, if there's like any holes that run next to each other and you're like, maybe it's easy, maybe we could cut off some yardage by going this way or check like, you know, there's always kind of ways to go about that even on the courses now. Um, in general, I usually walk the course with a, with just a laser and then a brake master, you know, one of those little, yep. Yep. one of those levels just to check out, you know, we, Sam um, uses the greens book. So it's, mm-hmm. I don't, those are so thorough, but it's nice to just double check a couple of the spots, especially where, you know, the pins have been years before and kind of can anticipate and just put it down and re- make a little note to make sure where the straight uphill putt is. Um, I had a feeling that maybe this next gen might be using other technology. Uh, a Jordan. So he says Jordan knows about this. So what's going on? You have some kind. Of, you don't have to give us all your secrets, but what are you yeah. doing out there when you're mapping these courses and stuff like that? Well, um, I used to travel with a digital level, and it's it's pretty much the same thing as a brake master. But I I was using the digital level to get the slope on the green contours when there were uh when Bo was playing on the corn fairy tour so that got a bit tedious but at the same time if if that's something that he wanted and if it was going to help him then i happily i'm going to do it so i uh i did have to do some extra work out there but it was well worth it what did, you know, what did you do? You were, cause there was no greens books on corn fairy. Did you do every three, like three yard increments or five? I did, I did five yard increments. So if you are familiar with like the yardage book and the, um, they're all in like 
the green depths are in five yard increments. So um, I would just basically find what the slope was doing, where those increments intersected. So it was like, kind of looks like, a, oh man, I don't know how to. Well, I, I definitely yeah. know because yeah. when that first started, when that first started, you would be surprised at who the guys were trying to get that extra leg up and, and designing their own greens books with the small, uh, well, it actually started out as a bubble level and it was about the size of a dinner plate. And it was this little green dinner plate and you'd see these caddies and five yards was kind of the thing. And that's probably why the grids in the books are five yards now because the early guys that were out there like you with this with this little bubble and you know it, it's just like a level whenever you saw wherever it was going they would put a mark now it's way more precise with like a percentage and and now you have the uh the whole finger lining thing up and i know they use those percentage numbers to to um help you out you know in, in making those putts but it i like what you said there jordan about you know you just you basically do what your player what you need to do to you know if they have confidence in what's going on out there whether they use it or not just knowing that they have that information could mean the difference between you know one making a cut and finishing 125 on the uh FedEx Cup or making a putt and winning a million and a half dollars somewhere you know yeah. so it's it's a it's a very fine line on on what we have to do sometimes out there so I, I kind of wanted to see what the next gen was doing as far as, um, you know, technology, because it, it, technology is advancing so far. And, and I had heard rumors that caddies were every night after they'd finished uh, walking the courses were on the Google Earth and, and, you know, manipulating things around and taking a look and saying, oh, OK, so it does match up from here or finding a special uh, spot somewhere and kind of drawing the line and say, okay, that's 150 yards or, or whatever from that tree. And uh, so that's kind of answered my question there, which is cool because I, I dig it. I, I remember, you know, when I was young and had to walk all these courses, um, do I walk courses now? Yeah, sure. Is it every week? At least once, but how thorough? I mean, the books are that good, right? So unless we go to a new course, then I've seen pretty much every spot on all these courses you know, being around them as many times as I have. Um, so it was kind of nice to see, because I, I know I've been at the course and see you guys coming in, uh, you know, early afternoon, late afternoon, or, you know, carrying the sticks. So I always, I always enjoyed seeing that because I remember being in your shoes and, and, uh, and, and that was fun. Uh, so we'll, we'll move along uh, in the happy hour here. Uh, I know, Dave, they call you Big Wave, and I'm assuming it's because of your Pepperdine. And, and I tried to do some digging around on Jordan, and the only thing I could come up with was, was Gil. So I'm sure uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, your inner circle guys are, are calling you Gil, short for Guilford, I assume. Is, is there anything else that these guys call you? Have you earned another nickname, Jordan? I have not earned another nickname. Okay. Um, but I mean, big wave, that's just one of the greatest nicknames of all time. So, so is there a story behind that? Is there a story behind the big wave? There, there is. I, uh, and the most common thing, the first thing I have to tell most people when they ask is that, no, I don't surf. They usually think it's cause I'm a California surfer or whatever. But I, uh, I, I went to Pepperdine. Our mascot is the waves and yeah. I, just I really had a great time in Malibu and loved Pepperdine and was you know loved playing for on the team with my uh, teammates and had great friends with the other athletes and as a result I remember my junior year I won an award called the wave of the year which is like you know it's not like for performance it's more just like for this athlete that best supports the other athletes and uh, I didn't have like an Instagram or Twitter I didn't have any social media yet and so senior year, they were like, we had a little seminar for all the athletes that said, hey, everyone has to get a Twitter because you're going to post like they're te they were teaching you how to brand yourself, especially if you're going to try to like turn pro or like use like your sport to like help you in business after. And they were like, yeah, you could do your name and my name. 
as we already DLO experience can confuse people and mispronounce. So there it's like, I was like, what? And actually it was one of my friends that like, you were wave of the year. Why don't you just do like big wave Dave that rhymes. And so I did it and it kind of is just stuck and it's just, it's just really easy, I guess. And it's, I like it because it reminds me back of like my college days. And I think it's just like, I'd rather have people just say something like big wave or wave than try to pronounce my last name. So sure, uh, it's sure. great. It's kind of helped. So right there, you kind of teed up my next little section here. I thought it was funny because now that I've been hosting a little bit, I've been, and then I've also gone on a couple different podcasts to try and figure out how to do this thing and all this stuff. And, and, these interviewers and stuff like that. Not that I'm calling myself an interviewer now, but uh, they always seem to dig up information. And I'm like, how in the fuck are these guys getting this information that I don't even, I mean, I didn't even remember that was what I was doing, but so I couldn't find anything on Gil. I, I went to social media and finally I, there's a, I find him on Twitter. He's got like 11, he's, he's following 11 11 people on the Twitter and I'm looking at them and three of them were like, let me, let me see what I got here. I was like, what did I find out here? I wrote it down. He follows 11, he follows 11 people. Right. And five of them are like news, news outlets, like, like yeah. the wall street journal and two, two people out, out of the 11. I'm like, Oh, it's okay. And then I couldn't find anything on Facebook or Instagram I'm like this guy has like a zero uh social footprint and I was laughing so hard. I was like oh yeah I went I went social media dark for um for a little while there so I've just I got that that Twitter with my 11 followers or whatever it is and then um <laughs> yeah uh that, that's so, about that's the extent I, I don't even know if you had any posts on that thing yeah, I, used to I don't really get twitter i don't understand twitter as much it's like the most difficult social platform for me but uh i i thought it was kind of funny being the the next gen which uh is a social generation and uh for you to be like so under the radar i i i didn't i i didn't i couldn't comprehend how how you could how you could kind of go without having this much interaction the way uh you know the younger people like of your generation do and i was like holy cow uh is there a specific reason for that is is it you're yeah, turning so into I a private a, i had an instagram account and i just it wasn't really doing much for me and i i kept like catching myself like aimlessly going on instagram and then like just staring at my phone for like an hour when i shouldn't be so i was just like i'm i'm done i'm gonna ax this instagram <laughs> you know. i got you and then dave i i found you uh on the instagram which is cool you 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 post just like you know like the rest of us just fun stuff that you're doing hanging around for friends and stuff like that but it was funny i was like well i'm gonna try and find some points to talk about and i'm like well gil has a zero social media footprint it was kind of funny so I'm glad we kind of got that in there. Do you see yourself kind of growing that footprint, Gil? Or what, what do you, you just, are you happy with where you are? Or, or what I do you think? I might do like a club pro guy type deal where I just, I just launch a, a totally different account where like no one knows who I am. But uh, do they have name? Do those kinds of accounts have a special name? Uh, like if you do that? Um, I don't know. Dave, you know? Dave? Um, some, I mean, I guess somebody, will, somebody will find it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So, I don't. It's got a name. I know they have a name. It's yeah. not. They're not. That's not catfishing, though, right? Catfishing is something uh, else. No, I think that catfishing is, yeah. is a little different. Okay. I don't know the... That's funny. What is catfishing? Have you guys ever been catfished or something? What What is catfishing? No, is that why you're so like social? Catfishing is I... when you when you pose as like someone on the internet, but it's not really you. And then you uh, bait people into doing. I don't. I don't know. Actually, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think. I mean, thankfully, I've never been catfished, but especially you know, watching the TV show, sometimes it's funny at night. But I mean, there's. I think it's just using pictures of someone else to make someone believe it's you, and then you like are talking to them under false pretenses, like, "Hey, I really look like some 
model. Oh, uh, I got you. So Google. like the like the dating apps and stuff like that is where yeah. you would find. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very cool, very cool. Um, what about? Let me uh, let's go into let's go back into golf just a little bit. And and I know you both played uh, college level golf. Jordan, what was the story with you? You you, you were oh. JUCO or did you make it to? Uh, the I, never, I never ended up uh I never ended up making it but uh I I played a ton of golf growing up and then um I tried out at a junior college um Saddleback and I had been taking classes there for a year and I didn't really think I was good enough to make the team so I I didn't try out until my second year going to school there and then um I tried out and made the team, but my grades were so bad that I didn't play because of uh, academic ineligibility. But it definitely um, – it was very motivating, like, for me to make the team and then not be able to play. That kind of, like, pissed me off. And then um, I ended up uh, moving up to Oregon to go to school and, like, was doing great up there. And then um, – working at Eugene country club. And, uh, but I never ended up playing like official college golf. Like I never played a, a tournament. So. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Uh, and we all know about academics. Sometimes you're at the top of the list. Sometimes you're in the middle, sometimes you're at the bottom, but Dave, how did it go for you? Uh, I, I know that you were you straight into uh, Pepperdine, or did you have to go uh, JUCO style first? Yeah, actually, well, for, before I say anything, I will say I've played with Gilf many times, especially in the Caddy Championship in Dallas a couple of years ago, and he beat me. So he definitely he definitely could have played, uh, made it to Division One golf. I think if circumstances would have been different, without a doubt, talent wise. Um, but no, like him, I actually played basketball growing up and my dad played in college and coached me growing up. And that was my love. And I had some issue. I stopped growing. And then my other issue was I kind of got a little back injury. Um, so I didn't even start playing my first golf tournament I ever played was like junior year in high school. And so I played at like 16, I started playing golf and got good enough to make a junior college team. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to pursue golf. So I went, actually same conference as uh, the school the JUCO Gilf went to. Um, he went to Saddleback. I went to Orange Coast College, um, made the team there and had a, had a really good freshman year and had a few offers and visited San Diego State and then uh, visited Pepperdine. And I mean, as soon as I stepped foot in Malibu, I was like, this is where I'm going. So I transferred there and did sophomore through senior year at Pepperdine. Oh, nice. Did you guys compete for the uh, national title? Because I know Pepperdine has had some national championship teams, I think, yeah. with Jason so, Gore and some of those old school guys. Gore, yeah, they, they, had, they won the title in 97 and have done – they basically were in the West Coast Conference, which is the same conference as Gonzaga, and people that know how much Gonzaga dominate in basketball, that's basically Pepperdine in golf. I mean, I think Pepperdine's had a program for – 30 years now, I guess. And I think we've won conference, the West coast conference, probably like 20 or 21 of those 30 years. Um, oh, wow. That's interesting. So my, we had a, there was a coaching change and coach beard, uh, Michael beard was a, the new coach. And I was one of the first people that came, he brought in. Um, and he's done an unbelievable job with the program. I think when I started there, they were ranked 155th in the country and we made it to my senior years. We made it to nationals. And then, um, Actually, this past year, it's such a bummer with this whole pandemic that the, the college season got cut short. But Pepperdine was ranked number one in the country this spring, um, and they just had to end the season. But so they've, it's been a, it's a great program, and I was happy to be a part of it. And our coach there is doing an amazing job. And so you're still a huge uh, Wave supporter in all their sports. Like you should be if being a grad from from there. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a small school, so it's like you don't have a huge national footprint. So, you know, when, you're, when you see, like, your old team or even, like, a, a volleyball team or something, make, like, rank number one, I think it's, it's pretty cool just to, like, show some pride and, and support them. Do you have a big wave tattoo? 
I have, I do not, but oh, yeah. I guess that's a good, that's a potential idea for the future. If they win the national title in golf, you're going to have to do it. Maybe right here on the neck. Yeah. <laughs> so can see um, the, uh, what, so what intrigued you guys both about the job? I mean, was it just like uh, you had mentioned earlier, Dave, that you were just going to kind of go for the summer instead of the internship and had some success is it is it that simple or were you like secretly going you know what i might i might kind of dig this you know what yeah i think just it comes to competitive nature and it was it just feels you know i definitely wasn't i'm not good enough to be playing like these guys are that we work for but i think it's a i i really like still feeling a part of it and being inside the ropes especially when you get in contention and you know, even Thursday, Friday, it's just like, just the air, like, you know, it, when you get to the range to warm up and go to the first tee, it feels different. It, it gives you like the, the competitive juices back. And, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I feel like I got good advice from my parents and other people, even the person that offered me the job in LA, they were like, there, you can get a jest job anytime in your life. Um, so I feel like it's great to be able to do this while I'm younger and can, can enjoy the traveling and being, you know, the being a part of like in being in the ropes and competing. I, I think it's, a, it's just, I'm hooked on it. Right. Jordan, when, what, what was your story? What, what had you kind of leaning more towards when you got the call from your friends and said, Hey, you know, this Bo Hostler, what, what were you doing in, in order to kind of make that connection? Uh, so I had, I had been catting at the time at Eugene country club, and um i had even caddied before that just for friends um because i i was never like i was never as good as a golfer as some of my friends so when they would play amateur events i would just like volunteer caddy and i just got into it through that and fell in love with it so um when when bo offered me the job i was caddying at eugene country club and then also uh coaching the south eugene axemen uh a high school team up there so that um that's kind of my golf background i guess if as far as like caddying goes and then once you once you got into it and you it 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 has to be the same i mean we kind of all have the same hat here it's the competitive juices that start flowing uh i've I've heard a lot of times it's it's kind of like it's like being in the dugout, right? You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're there inside the ropes. Uh, you know, you feel the heat when, when things are, you know, getting intense and, and you're the only other one that they have to rely on. And, you know, you, you, you feel that, that pressure, that intensity that, you know, and, and it's fun. You get done, whether you end up winning or not, you're like, holy cow, that was, that was pretty fun. Right. You know? So I'm assuming that's what's kept you in the game, uh, Jordan, just trying to, um, you know, and we all know when your player does well, you do well, but that's, that's not really the main thing. It, it, it's the competitiveness that probably drives us the most, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and just the, like, the supportive part of it, kind of like, like what Dave was saying, it's like you're, you're alongside them in the tournament and like you're you're there to help and like it's when you do help it it's really rewarding but when you don't it's like i mean the the lows are the lows are very low and the highs are very high so when i was um when i was chatting with another pod group uh these canadian guys they were kind of you know some different things came up and they were like how do you start caddying all this stuff but what about, you know, the pressure being a rookie and being one or two years in, having to learn different golf courses and stuff, did you feel like the heat or the eyes of other caddies, experienced guys on you, or, or do you still feel that kind of pressure to, to perform, to make sure that you keep your, your job? That, uh, uh, and, and after we get the answers, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that a couple of the veteran guys had said. And I, I, so is there pressures like that? I mean, do you sometimes get a sense that, oh, these guys keep eyeballing me. It's, I got to do something better in order to stick around. Uh, Do you find it tough or or what's the story? 
you know. Mm. Okay, uh, Dave. Yeah, I, you know, I definitely, I've had that. I think it's, uh, of course, you're if you're out, you're out there with your player and you come out, like this is my example, if you come out with a good game plan and it suits your player's strengths, then you're going to run with it no matter what. And But I can remember a few times being out there and like, tournaments going well or you're paired with a a more experienced player and caddy on the weekend and you know in a threesome your guy pulls driver on like the par four where you don't really need it and the two old guys just hit a little iron down the fairway and you can just tell they're all like what are these guys doing why do they have driver out and it's like you know sometimes where it's just like you know every player and caddy and the you got to play to your player's strengths if they just it fits their eye and they like it then you're let's go hit bomb it but it's just, I just, I have felt that in the past where it's kind of funny. Like you feel like the guys are looking at you like, uh, are you going to let him hit this? Like, right. Oh, that's what we were getting. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think, yeah. I, it, I think that's, you know, it's kind of funny and it's like, no, you know what, if I was playing, I might hit iron too, but th- this is what my guy, this is what my player is good at. I'm going to, and he's confident in it. I'm going to let him go with it. That's awesome. yeah, I don't know if I've ever felt pressure from other caddies, but uh just try to try to do a good job for the player and then that'll take care of everything right so so one of the guys had mentioned you know the way you keep your job is by not being wrong pulling good clubs so you have to be a good pull club puller in order to make this job work because uh the the story now is it's it's a lot like you said you you had a teammate that got on tour and they brought another teammate out, right? So that's how you got your start, Dave. Jordan, you you got your start by finding, um, you know, a connection. You were caddying and you you did an amateur an amateur tournament, and then it turned into you know the pro game. But obviously, you guys are continuously, uh, you know, moving upward in the right direction. You know, you're you're four, three, and four years in. Uh, so that's telling me as an older guy and, and veteran that you're obviously pulling good clubs because if you don't pull good clubs, you don't hang around very long, right? You've seen it even in, even in your circles of, you know, next gen players, next gen caddies, a couple of guys, you know, they get cut and you don't see them back out, uh, because there's more experienced guys. Um, would you agree with, uh, you know, you got to be right a lot of the time. I mean, you're not going to be right 100%, but you've got to have a, a 90 percentile of some sort, the higher the better, you know. And, and we know the players, it's still on them, but if you're hit, pulling five iron and it's bouncing over the back, you know, you're going to get the look. Uh, yeah. And you do that too many times, you, you don't make it too many weeks, right? Right. Uh, that's pretty cool. So let me ask you this. Um, Y'all both are Orange County guys growing up, and you're both fairly young. Uh, you didn't really know each other growing up or played junior golf against each other? We did play one tournament against each other. Uh, I believe it was the 2012 San Clemente City Open. The San Clemente City, yes. Is, is, that, held at a, is that held at a muni course? Is it yeah, like a – it Yeah, one of, the, one of the greatest munis on, on – on earth i'd say it's the best best muni in orange county for sure yeah was it a yeah. scenario where you guys were younger and y'all were playing against 30 year olds or was was it was it it wasn't yeah it was an open thing. it was like an open field so there were like old dudes yeah. young dudes and uh High schoolers junior college players yeah. Old dudes yeah that but, was my that was my home track so i definitely had a competitive advantage over big wave here and i I played some of my best golf that week and uh, finished a solo third. So I always have that to uh, to hang over Big Wave's head. Yeah, I think I finished ninth. So he definitely got the best of me there. Oh, I but okay, so ten there. But we didn't. We all that. had a brief meeting, or maybe yeah. not. No, we didn't, we didn't find out until uh, whatever. I think we were in caddy dining one day or something, and we were talking about. Uh, our best golf moments. Yeah. And that was my best golf moment. We almost had this moment. Before you moved to Nashville, Gilf, I think we were talking about like either last year or like two off season ago saying like, Hey, why, we should go play in the San Clemente city. Yeah. And then you were like, I have played in it. And then we realized we played in it the same year. In the yeah. 
So right now it sounds like it's Gil 2, Big Wave O in the caddy matches going all the way back. Uh, I think Big Wave's a little more consistent than I am. I mean, the guy's got a pure golf swing, does does a lot of things right. I I, I kind of just – I get away with a few things here and there. Are you guys traveling with your golf clubs week to week? Are you are you finding are you finding matches uh you know in your off time or what's the story there? Uh to be honest, I have not traveled with my clubs a lot unless I knew it was like a city or you know a two three week stretch where I had places to play or new people in those cities. Um but the reason I didn't is honestly I played so much in college that I just felt like I was burnt out and then after caddying the last thing I want to do is go to another course but I'm starting I'm starting to get the itch a little bit to play and I think I might try to bring them around you know this summer and I think it's real I I feel like as long as I have the itch to play and can find matches with other caddies that are good players it's why would you pass up opportunities to play all these courses in like the cities we get to go to that you know we normally wouldn't be able to so Gil, do you travel with your clubs? Are you playing much? Uh, um, what's, what's the story? I will occasionally bring them along, but for the most part, I don't. I don't travel with them. Right. I'll, I'll bring them out uh, to Palm Springs because they have that uh, that fun tournament. The there. night golf, the the, yeah. the part three night. Yeah, that's always a great, yeah. good little fun event. That's an exciting one. Um, so got to bring the sticks for that, but. Uh, no, I, I don't bring them along. I think we're going to see a spike in caddies traveling with their clubs because of this, uh, you know, this hiatus we're on. A, a lot of caddies are out playing golf, and like you said, the itch is kind of growing. I agree. Uh, it, it's pretty wild. It's fun. Um, before we kind of went live here, Jordan, you were talking about an anniversary. Yeah. Fill us in on that because I thought that was pretty funny. What What's the backstory there? So I woke up today knowing that, you know, we're going to have this call and I'm like, dang, like, what are we going to talk about? Got D-Lo and Big Wave here. And I couldn't help but remember, I was like, well, where, where did I meet these guys? And I met you guys at the Byron Nelson when it was at Las Colinas the last year, uh, it was 2017. So D-Lo, I met you in the 16th fairway par five you got you uh, you were working for Stuart Appleby and and we uh you let us join you so shout out to that thank you for letting us join you and uh big wave we got paired together uh when he was working for Brian Campbell so I this marks our our three-year anniversary as friends so for the week yeah Yeah, that's pretty wild because I I you know and then it kind of blew me away when you're like, Oh yeah, I remember meeting you three years ago. And for me, everything runs, you know, three years could be 13 years. You know what I mean? It, that's how long it's been going. And then that's when I asked, I was like, Oh, was that when you were, you were giving me the, uh, the uh, music advice with this post Malone. I'm like, who's post Malone. And you're like, you don't know who post Malone is. And I'm like, oh, I'm so I was really showing my age there, but but that was funny. And so that was even before then when we had met. We'd, so it's it's very cool that um, you would remember something like that. And then I'm sure if I if I really thought hard, you know, some of the guys that I'm closest with now, I could dig up at how how we met, you know, where we were walking the course or, like you said, a practice round somewhere or getting paired. Um, what, what about uh, – since since so cheers here here here's cheers cheers to that oh, there cheers. jordan dave uh yeah. i'm not cheers sure when we may be hooked up there but um i'm i'm sure i met you guys pretty early too dave I, i'm not sure if you could even dig that out that would be pretty awesome if you could but i i would have to just say agree with you and be like yeah yeah oh yeah we probably did meet then but uh yeah. Well, I mean, I know we've been lucky enough to be, I know for a fact we've been paired together, you know, a hand five, six, even more times, I feel yeah. like over the last few years. So I, yeah, it'd be hard. I don't remember what the exact, the first one right. was. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, which is cool, which is very cool. And then, um, you know, we're, we're kind of getting close to the end. They've been doing some, 
uh, I've been seeing this rapid fire questions and stuff like that. But before we do anything like that, because I don't really even have any rapid fire questions, that's something I want to start. But what have you been doing at home to to kill time? You know, now we're third. Uh, how many days? I don't know how many days. We're two months in, right? We're 50 That's days fine. and yeah, whatever. We flew, home, we flew home from the players March 13th, Friday yeah. the 13th. I'll remember that. Oh, um, yeah. And today's the 12th. So we're yeah. going on exactly two months now as we record this. Um, what's been happening? Because I know, I know, Gil, you moved to Tennessee. Yeah. So what was, what was the story there? I've been in Nashville since March 7th, I think. It was I, – I flew over here after the Arnold Palmer. So, i just been hanging out here, uh, trying to stay in caddy shape. Um, read a couple books for once, so that was cool. Um, felt, felt like I accomplished something there. And uh, cooking and baking, just making – making all sorts of stuff in the kitchen and trying to, trying to be healthy. There you go. That sounds like a common theme cooking. I actually read a book myself, which was a reread because I had um, read this book 10 years ago or whatever. And, and I've never even really reread a book. You know, I, I'm a <laughs> read a book once guy and that's it. And so I found the book. It was called the match. So I don't know if you've ever read it. Oh, yeah. Read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about it, but that should be the next golf movie, in my opinion. Uh, that was at it went down at like Cypress Point or something. Right. It was like Ben Hogan and uh, keep going, spit it out. You can do it. Well, I didn't. I didn't read it, but it's on my list. Yeah, put it on your list. An amateur named Harvey Ward and Ken Venturi. Right. Then right. Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson in the. Uh, it was in the fifties, like nineteen fifty-six or something unbelievable read especially knowing those are places you've been to and you know 17 yeah. mile drive and you know pebble beach and you know the pro-am uh it's real it's really pretty cool read like i said it would be an awesome awesome book to uh i mean to make it the next golf movie you know what i mean it, it's kind of tough to make golf movies but that one would be a really cool one what dave uh what have you been doing uh to kind of kill time and, and do all this stuff. Yeah, I uh, I read, I've finished one book also. I got to add the match to my list too. I read, I finished the David Goggins book called Can't Hurt Me, The Marine. Um, so actually I got recommended that by one of the players and I thought that was a great book just about mental toughness and what it takes and like train your body to get through painful things and he did it it's a it's a really easy read and it's motivational so it's, i'd recommend that um other than that i started i tried starting to learn how to play the piano because i'm not very musical and i'm lucky I'm, people in my family know how to play so i get pointers here and there but i'll say it's harder than it looks and i haven't really made it through all two months of learning i can play like jingle bells but that's about it at this point um, and then on, the weather has been great here. So going to the beach, um, and going on some friends boats, fishing a little bit, hopefully they don't fully shut down the beaches. They've, they try, they talk about, Oh, it's not safe to go to the beach, but then people are, I mean, there's so much room you could be away from people. So just trying to stay active as much as possible too. So when that time does come, we're back carrying the bag. We don't just get crushed that first week. Yeah. What kind of uh, I, I got I got sidetracked, but what kind of um, exercising in caddy shape? If you can't go to the gym and you guys are gym rats, what the uh, maybe? What are you doing? Are you just doing push-ups till you can't push up anymore, or yeah, what's I'm the story? Push-ups, push sit-ups, you know, some squats, just like air stuff, core stuff, and then. Right. I like, I'm going down like almost every night at sunset and just running on the beach, just doing three, four miles here and there. So cardio, a lot of cardio. Yeah. yeah. So I have a, I have a nephew that's a physical therapist, uh, Trenton Savello. And, uh, he has been giving me like these physical therapy exercises to do. And it's all like mobility and, uh, like get, getting like my core strong so that when I put that bag on, 
it's nothing. And, uh, so the doctors got me doing these physical therapy exercises. And so I've been doing those, those have been keeping me busy. And, uh, so that's been good. Nice. Well, that's good. I, and I'm really stoked for you guys. Now I need to take some of y'all's motivation and try and seep it into my own because I think about going out there and doing push ups or running and I've gone on a few walks and stuff, but I really got to get better at kind of getting myself back into shape, especially, uh, you know, being, this is even a longer break than off season so far. You know what I mean? We don't even have this kind of off season. It's pretty freaky. Um, but I'm going to, uh, as we wrap it up, I'm going to steal this um, rapid fire question stuff that these guys have been doing. So I'm going to have two different questions. I just came up with them. Pretty simple. I'll, uh, I'll go with you first, Jordan. Okay. And say, um, what is on tour your favorite event to go to? go to you look forward to it the absolute most every year pebble beach definitely pebble yeah beach. what is it about pebble beach that draws you in uh, the scenery the like just the views on the golf course and the history there it's like it all together it's like you just get the you get the the goosebumps walking around there yeah yeah i get it because it's one of the top of you know, top on my list as well. So, so that's cool. And then um, for you, Big Wave, I want to know on tour, what is your number one most favorite restaurant that every year you're like, oh, I can't wait to go back and have that food or have those drinks or, or you know, the hangout. What, what is it? Yeah, that's actually really easy. It's at Travelers and it's like, it's a kind of, it's like 30, 40 minutes from uh, the tournament, but you drive south to New Haven and where, uh, where Yale is and they have probably the best pizza in the world. It's either Sally's a pizza or Frank Pepe's. There's a street with, you know, the coal fired pizza and like the, it's unbelievable. I, I drive, I do that drive probably four times that week to eat it. That's funny. That's funny. You say that because I know Pepe's well, I, uh, you know, when I first started in, in my circle of guys, uh, Hauser, Matto is one of my best buds and he's from Connecticut right there. And so we've been going to Pepe's, you know, from the start since the nineties, the late nineties, it's, it's an unbelievable pie. And, and a lot of people talk about, Oh, New Jersey, New York pizza. Well, I think Connecticut has to definitely be in the fight. You know, I agree. It's it's like that uh, it's like that scene from the Anchorman when all the different news channels are coming in to start the brawl and they're like, uh, the Ben Stiller comes in with the Mexican one and he's like, hey, some bitches, you know. It's funny because Connecticut pizza is probably you know for me the best. It, you know yeah. they talk about New York style, but and they're all the same thin flat pizzas, but that Connecticut pizza is definitely uh, on the list. That's awesome. Um, all right. So anything else you guys kind of want to talk about? You want to plug anything you've got? A, do you have a uh, what do you call it? Uh, I know the next gen they like they have a cause. Is You want to put something out there for a cause or anything like that? Feel free. This is a platform to do it. Uh, I mean, shout out to mom and dad. They they are just the greatest people ever. So I got to just give them a shout out because uh, that's cool. They you know, they provided a lot for me. And I, you know, I was, I was probably a dick growing up and, you know, they were always really nice. So I, I feel like I owe them that. So. There you go. So much love to the mom and pops. I love it. That yeah. boy, Jordan, that's the way to be. <laughs> uh, Dave, anything else you want to, you kind of want to leave us with or how, what do you got? I don't know. I could follow up mom and dad without looking <laughs> like a bad person. Um, no, I've been – I actually got to – I FaceTimed and got to chat uh, with Sam, with my boss, um, the la actually last weekend and the last couple of days just been chatting. And, I mean, I'm just excited to get back to work. And I think he's itching to play too. So, excited to see you guys and the other caddies and all our boys out there and, you know, get that to the ball up and go again. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's been a common theme. And, and, and doing this, this style on zoom is kind of therapeutic because I haven't seen you guys in two months. And, yeah. uh, and it was kind of a fun way to kind of dig in and get to know you both a little better. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to, um, 
you know, record another episode like this where we're live and in person. So I'd love to have you guys back. I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time and, and chatting with us and, and uh, you know, just kind of developing, uh, you know, content and whatnot. So uh, you guys were awesome guests. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I look forward to like seeing you guys in the flesh and having a beer, a real happy hour. That's right. Same here. Honored, Thanks, honored to be here. All right. Well, there you go, folks. I had uh, Jordan Gill Guilford and, and Big Wave Dave, David. Pelacutis on today's show. So that was fun chatting. I hope you guys enjoyed. You guys stay tuned and we will catch you next time.